Sorry, I've been gone. I've been painting like a motherfucker. Actually, hold on a second. I'll go get a painting for you. Sir, you stay right here. I'm sorry. I'm going to make you uncomfortable real quick. Okay, so I'm back. But yeah, I've been doing um commissions and everything. This is one of the ones I did. This is for one of my people that I decided to do one for. This one's actually going to be a freebie because it's Christmas and that's a present. But yeah, I've been doing stuff like that. I've gotten like another four to do. I just got through with another seven, so that's been fun. That's what I've been up to. Y'all would know because I haven't really been letting people know, but that's okay. Better just to be like doing what you need to do. Are you leaving me? Are you? Hmm? You don't have to. Well, I understand if you do. And be a movie and such. I don't mind if you judge me. No, I don't. Anyway, um, we're going to be watching this today. Which is, this theory proves by the existence of a hidden universe. How did this happen? This is by Fexel. Fexel, yeah, Fexel. How many multiverses are there? How many ways can you ask that question? I guess this is a better thing. I'm just looking over here and watch my call. Anyway, let's get started with this. Go. <laughs> Give it a like. There is an old philosophical question Shit. about a tree in a forest. If it falls with nobody there to hear it, does it make a sound? If you ask a quantum physicist this question, they might say the sound was there, but you couldn't be sure the tree was, which is a strange answer if you think about it. Quantum mechanics has continuously pushed the boundaries of our understanding of the tiniest aspects of reality. Numerous experiments have... Wait! But what else would make the sound of a tree if the tree wasn't there? Or are we talking about there was a tree there somewhere else at this time, but we're just hearing it now? Or are we hearing it now before it actually happens? And then we see the result. But then wouldn't that happen again? I'm not sure how that would work. Revealed that particles behave like waves or can appear to be in multiple places simultaneously. In the quantum world, we can only determine the likelihood of something appearing in one place or another until we observe it, at which point it assumes a definite position. This Thank concept you, troubled Albert Einstein, who once stated, I like to think that the moon is there, even if I am not looking at it. Since the discovery of the strange behavior of quantum systems, we've had to confront what appears to be an uncomfortable truth. For some reason, it seems that what we consider as reality, the location of objects and their properties, isn't fundamentally That's predetermined. Really nifty, like, if you don't measure set. or interact with your quantum system, it remains in an uncertain state. We can only describe its properties and the potential measurement outcomes in a statistical and probabilistic manner. But is this an inherent limitation of nature, where there's an innate unpredictability until a measurement or quantum interaction takes place? Or could there be a hidden reality beneath what we observe that is entirely predictable, comprehensible, and deterministic? So what, fate? Yeah, like, you know, we know what that is. That's fate. That's, that's all that is. Um. But see, the thing is, is like, the only way that'd be possible is everything actually existing all at the same time. We're just not in time with everything. Because it's not our time. We're in this time, not that time. You know, there's a time when I would eat a donut for breakfast and a time when I would eat oatmeal for breakfast. And then there's a time I would eat a leftover hamburger for breakfast. And there's a time when I'll eat peach cobbler. There's a time when I'll eat something with cinnamon in it, even though I'm deathly allergic to cinnamon. There's something with coconut. I hate coconut, but this version of me likes coconut. So it's like all those things could be playing out all at once. It's not that, like, I believe that it's an observable universe, and the only way that things link up is by being observed. I think what it is, is like when we observe it, it locks it in place. Um, the most likely scenario at that time when we catch it, you know. 
Um, we don't have to catch, like, what happens at the car wreck. Sure, other people see it, but we know that there's a car wreck because other people saw it, they're observing it as well, but you didn't observe it, right? But everybody else is acting as if they did. You're the only one who did you heard the crash. Um, you noticed a car crash somewhere. Um, is it because you didn't see it? The car suddenly isn't there? No, that's not how it works. It's there. Whether or not we observe it or not. What it is, is whether or not we are... Well, in the same, I guess, photon pathway... For this to just light up. Like, you know, in the ping pong game, you hit this and it goes ting, 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 ting. Nothing up here is going to get lit up till it hits. And I think that's the main part of the observation is also like, yeah, um, we can see all these particles and waves doing all this different shit or whatever, but the thing is, is like, that doesn't really do much of anything considering there are all these different possibilities, but we're only paying attention to two. Is it a particle or a wave? But what if it's something we don't even know what it is? And it, we, and our only ways of perceiving that is either a particle or a wave. And that makes the observer flawed. You know what I mean? Because there's shit out there I've seen that I have no idea what the fuck it is. And I'm not ignorant enough to ask anybody else if they've seen this. Because that would definitely probably get me locked up in a psych ward. Like, there, uh-uh, no. There's some things that are out there that I have no idea what it is. And I am perfectly fine with that. I don't know is an acceptable answer no matter how it makes everybody else uncomfortable. Who gives a fuck? That's a really shiny eyeball. Oh, it's gone. Reality is a complicated thing, especially when it comes to quantum phenomena. Let's start with the most famous example of quantum indeterminism, the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle. Heisenberg! In the classical everyday world, there is no right. issue with measurement. Hmm? You can take any object you like. Whether yeah. it's a jet, a car, a tennis ball, a pebble, or even a speck of dust. Mm -hmm. And not only measure any of its properties oh, as you wish, pretty. but based on the known laws of... Hold up, hold up, hold up. Do it again. ...ball, a pebble, or even a speck of dust. And not only measure any... I'm gonna draw that. I'm gonna draw that. I'm gonna draw, I'm gonna, I'm gonna paint it and doodle it. That's what I'm gonna do. That's gonna be fun as fuck. ...of its properties as you... I like that one. ...wish, yeah, but based I, on I the known like laws the of physics, like we can predict those properties far into the future. All the equations formulated by that. Newton, Einstein, and Maxwell are oh, entirely God, deterministic. If you provide the positions and motions of every particle in your system or the entire universe, scientists can accurately tell you where they will be and how they will move at any future moment. The only uncertainties we encounter are due to the limitations of the measurement tools we employ. Look at that Gatling gun getting ready to blast at a fucking Goku motherfucker because he won't fucking die. Look at that. Look at that. Vegeta's all mad. It's, it's all purple. He's ready. I'm going to shoot the fuck out this monkey's motherfucking ass. He won't go. Him and his son and his bald midget friend. I got rid of the green guy. Why won't this guy go? You know? However, in the realm of quantum physics, That's this is pretty. no longer the case. There exists an intrinsic uncertainty in how precisely you can simultaneously determine a wide range of properties. If you attempt to measure, for Limited. instance, the position and momentum of a particle, the energy and lifetime of a particle, the spin in two perpendicular directions, the, the angular that? position and angular momentum of a particle... Hey you will discover that there is a limit to how accurately you can know both of these properties at the same time. The product of these properties cannot be smaller than a fundamental value, which is proportional to Planck's constant. In fact, the instant you measure one such quantity to a very fine precision, the uncertainty in the other, complementary one, will spontaneously increase so that the product is always greater than a specific value. Traditionally, we okay. viewed the quantum world as inherently uncertain, and this uncertainty can't be entirely eliminated. When you precisely determine a property like the spin of a particle in one dimension, the uncertainty in perpendicular dimensions must increase without limit to comply with Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. In so you measure something here in the third dimension in order to, you'd have to go to a greater maximum in the ninth dimension? 
Is that why everyone looks round and fat at the same time when I'm looking at that shit? Because, like, honestly, it's like some, like... Attack on Titan, smush chibi. Like, there's no in-between. Have a conversation with yourself. Don't worry about it. In essence, you can't cheat the uncertainty principle. Meaningful knowledge about the actual outcome of a quantum system can only be obtained through measurements. However, there has long been an alternative concept, the idea of hidden variables. In a scenario involving hidden variables, the universe is fundamentally That's deterministic. Quantum entities have intrinsic properties that could, in theory, allow us to predict precisely where they would end up and the outcome of any quantum experiment in advance. The catch is that some of these governing variables are beyond our ability to measure with our current understanding of reality. If we could access and comprehend these hidden variables, we'd realize that the indeterminate behavior we observe is essentially a product of our lack of knowledge about what's truly happening. With a full understanding of these underlying variables, the quantum universe would appear far less mysterious. Aren't you humans done with, like, trying to figure out what the fuck it is? Is. You know, I don't know is a completely acceptable answer. I don't know, I guess it's my fault for being comfortable. With, like, you know, well, you know what, some things aren't just meant for me to know, and that's... It's probably the better I... It's better I stay where I is instead of trying to go and look for shit because I'm going to end up in some haunted house and then some bitch is going to trip me while running away from a serial unaliver and I don't want to be unalived in the unalivement. It should have been her. That's not what I actually... Well, yeah, I mean that because I want to live, but, like, I wouldn't want her to go. But she ain't going to help me surprise. She's going to panic, so she got to go. I'm, 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 and if she trips me, I'm finding a way grabbing her legs, and I'm rolling over. I'm going to try to trip that motherfucker on top of her. I don't care. I'm not, I'm, I'm, like, I'm not Jesus. I'm not dying for you. There ain't no way. But, um. What the fuck were we just talking about? Oh, the mysterious. Yeah, I was, I'm like, is there any point where, like, people just stop wanting to know answers to everything? Curiosity killed the cat. Well, satisfaction brought it back. But you're not a cat. You also don't have nine lives. My question would be, with this video that came out about a month ago, right? Um... Why do you want to find the hidden universe, and what do you think is in it? What would you think is in it, and what makes you? Th it, it, and is there a reason why we can't go near it, or better yet, it can't come near us? You know, questions. Come here. One of the greatest physicists of the twentieth century was Just John today. Wheeler. Wheeler was thinking about this quantum hey, weirdness. Here about how these quanta sometimes behave as particles and sometimes Miller, as waves. When he began to devise experiments that attempted to catch these quanta acting like waves, when we expect particle-like behavior and vice versa. Perhaps the most illustrative of these experiments is shown passing a photon through a beam splitter and into an interferometer, one with two possible configurations, open and closed. Interferometers function by directing light in two different paths and then recombining it at the end, creating an interference pattern based on the difference in the path lengths or the time it takes for light to travel through the two routes. Wheeler's curiosity led him to wonder if these photons somehow knew in advance how they should behave. He would commence the experiment in one configuration, and then, just before the photons reached the end of the experiment, he would either open or close or not the apparatus at the end. If the light had pre-knowledge of what it was going to do, you'd be able to catch it in the act of being a wave or a particle, even when you change the final outcome. Uh -huh. In the so realm of do? the physical universe, oh, it's light. crucial to remember that no matter how confident we are in our logical reasoning and the soundness of our mathematics, experimental results are the ultimate judge of reality. 
When we conduct experiments and attempt to derive the governing rules from them, we must uh -huh. arrive at a consistent framework. Yeah. While there are numerous interpretations of quantum mechanics, uh -huh. all equally successful in describing reality, none have contradicted really the predictions of the original things. interpretation. Preferences for one interpretation over another, which many people have for reasons not easily explained, yeah. essentially boil down to ideology. No matter how uncomfortable it may be, there's a certain level of weirdness inherent to quantum mechanics that we cannot eliminate. You might not find the idea of a fundamentally uncertain universe appealing, but the alternative interpretations, including those involving hidden variables, yeah. are in their own manner mm. equally peculiar. Yeah. When we look so out at the happened? universe today, it simultaneously tells us two stories. Okay, but what happened with Wheeler? I know we got like a whole other like... 13 some odd well yeah actually like more almost 14 minutes got another 14 minutes i wanted to know what happened with wheeler's fucking experiment though i know you didn't finish that i know i wasn't talking that fucking much you didn't tell me what happened i was sitting here like but you're like you know what i just need to be patient i need to be patient it's about itself one of those stories is written on the face of what the universe looks like today Where? and includes the stars and galaxies we have how they're clustered and how they move and what ingredients they're made of. This story has two parts. I the first part is about the universe we see around us, which we understand by just looking at it. The second part is about how the universe became the way it is today. Uh -huh. Figuring this out is a bit the more complicated. We can study things far away to learn about the distant past, like when the light we see today was first produced. Now, I'm a hilljack from West Virginia, right? But I know there ain't no satellite that can move that fast around all that shit. Quit making shit up. But to truly Stars understand it, shit. we have to use our scientific theories, like the laws of physics and the Big Bang Theory. When we do that, we find strong evidence that before the Big Bang, there was something called cosmic inflation. Oh However, God, there's to inflation make our observations the match our theories, we have to accept the idea of a multiverse. That's why many physicists believe in the existence of a multiverse. In the 19... Um, see, I don't... I don't... There's layman's multiverse, and then there's the actual scientific community's version of multiverse. Which, now I gotta find that chick's video, because she actually explains that a little bit, but it's like... It's, it's, um... Well... He's not wrong. Like, it, it's... It, Yes, but no. You know, yes, but no. With with the, with strong Italian fingertips, right? Like salt everywhere. You know. Yes, but no. Kind of. Yes, but no. Yeah, that's the yes, but no. Yes, but no. Yes, but. Twenties. No. Scientists found strong evidence that the many spirals and elliptical shapes we see in the sky are not just individual stars but are actually whole galaxies. Yeah, I was about to say, they also disc. noticed that the farther a galaxy is from us, the more its light gets stretched to longer wavelengths. At first, there were different ideas about what this meant. Okay, that was but me. as more evidence came in, only one explanation remained. What? The entire universe was getting bigger, like how dough with raisins in it expands as it bakes. If the universe is getting bigger today, and the ra- I did not just hear- what? Dough with raisins. There are chocolate chips. There's macadamia nuts. Thank you, phone. You know, McDonald's sells these things called griddle cakes. You know, griddle cakes. And they got little pieces of fucking syrup in it. And those expand out. Well, technically, in, uh, like I used to work there when they brought them out. Uh, actually, they nuked them in a little, like, uh, quick cue microwave, and then they throw them in the toaster to let them, like, toast out. That's how they're actually made. They're not actually baked there. Uh, but, yeah, that's how they do it. They nuke them in a the microwave, and then they stick them through a little, like, slot toaster. And if they don't... And, and, and the thing is, if they run out of time to make the shit in the toaster, they'll just nuke the shit twice 
Just make sure to turn it over in between and then still serve it. That's why your biscuits tend to be soggy near the end of the breakfast shit. It's because of that. They don't actually, like, let them bake out all the way. Because, like, usually biscuits take still um, 15 to 30 minutes, if I remember correctly, in their ovens. So if they don't have time to bake them biscuits, it's like 10 minutes to the fucking clock. You're getting double nuked fucking biscuits. I'm just letting you know. Like, thank you for coming to my witch talk. I'm just letting you know. But, well, no. Hex talk. Because fuck witch talk. Fuck all of TikTok, honestly. Well, some parts of TikTok are cool. But humans just end up ruining everything as soon as, like, the dumb ones get in. And there are always more dumb ones than there are the smart ones. And then even the smart ones are pretty dumb, too. So then we're all lost in that shit. But, yeah. I don't understand why it's gotta be raisins. Like, there's other stuff you can put in that's going to expand out. What if it's sawdust? What if it's poison? That'll definitely spread out in some fucking dough while it's baking. I promise. Don't poison anybody. That's your PSA for today. Don't poison, strangle, garret, behead. Don't be doing horrible things. Very bad enough people are outside doing horrible things. We're going to you're going to want to come inside, and that's when you really should be scared. Radiation, and it is shifting to longer wavelengths and lower energy. Then Good in the past, them. the universe must have been smaller, denser, more even, and hotter. When we consider that matter and radiation are part of this expanding universe, the Big Bang Theory leads to three clear predictions. There should be a vast cosmic network where galaxies grow, change, and group together more as time goes on. We should find a background of low-energy radiation that remains from the early universe when neutral atoms first formed in its hot state. The proportions of the lightest elements, like hydrogen, helium, lithium, and their different forms, should mm. be consistent, even in areas where stars have never formed. All three of these predictions have been confirmed by observations, which is why the Big Bang Theory is the leading scientific explanation for the origin of our universe. It has outperformed all competing theories. Hey, y'all ever heard of the God Seed? Let's look this up real quick. God Seed Theory. Because I actually like it. Oh, it's called Serpent Seed now? What? Wait, what? The doctrine of the serpent seed known as the dual seed or dual seed line doctrine is a controversial and fringe Christian religious belief which explains the biblical account of the fall of man by saying that the serpent mated with Eve in the Garden of Eden and the offspring of their union was Cain? It was based on poor biblical interpretation and superstition. Racial prejudice. What? So people think that like Eve had sex with Satan? What? Pigs. God particle. That's what it is. That's where I'm fucking it up. Okay. Oh, this is even a recent one, too. The existence of the Higgs boson completes the standard model of particle physics. The Higgs boson is a fundamental force carrying particle of the Higgs field, which is responsible for granting other particles their mass. This field was first proposed in the mid 60s by Peter Higgs, for whom the particle was named and his colleagues. The particle was finally discovered on June 4th, or no, July, my bad, July 4th. Oh! Independence Day! Let freedom ring. Let the drunk mailman sing. I don't know the words. So, um, it was discovered by researchers at the Large Hadron Collider, LHC. 
might as well call it an LLC, but okay. The most powerful particle accelerator in the world. And it's located at the European Particle Physics Laboratory, CERN, Switzerland. The eight... The L... Uh, we'll just call it Hadron. Hadron confirmed the existence of the Higgs field and the mechanism that gives rise to the mass, and thus completed the standard model of the particle physics. The best description we have of a subatomic world. As scientists approach the end of the 20th century, advances in particle physics has answered many questions that surround the fundamental building blocks of nature. Yet, as physicists steadily populate the particle zoo with electrons, protons, bosons, and all flavors of quarks, some pressing questions remain stubbornly unanswered. Among these, why do some particles have mass? That's not the part I actually want to look at, though. <laughs> the Higgs Boston nicknamed the God Particle was solidified upon its discovery, namely as a result of the popular media. The origin of this is often connected to the Nobel Prize winning physicist Leon Lederman, referring to the Higgs Boston as the Goddamn Particle. In the frustrations with regards to how difficult it was to detect. That's fucking awesome! <laughs> The, this is insider says that when leader that authored the book on the Higgs Boston in the 1990s, the title was to be the goddamn particle, but the publishers changed this to the god particle, and the troublesome connection with religion was drawn, one which bothers physicists to this day. So I did not know that. Why is this so important? The weak force carrier should be massless, and if they weren't, this risked breaking a principle of nature called symmetry, which, just like the symmetry of the shape ensures it looks the same if it's turned or flipped, ensures the laws of nature are the same, however they are viewed. Putting mass arbitrarily into particles also caused certain predictions to tread towards infinity. Yet researchers knew that because the weak force was so strong over short distance interactions, much more powerful than gravity, but very weak over long interactions, its boxons must have mass. Hmm. See, there, there, there is one thing that I remembered about this. Oh, look at all that shit. I don't know what that is. I'm not... Gage Bossons. Oh, is this what they're all... Oh, I remember this because it had the little things and the balls all on it. I remember this. Anti-bottom, anti-top, anti-charm, anti-strange, anti-down, anti-up, top, bottom, a strange, charm, up. Did that say Naruto? No, that's Neutrino. Ha! <laughs> Anti Neutrino. Anti Naruto. Then there's the Bossons. I remember this. Shit. What the fuck are you doing? I, I don't want to sign up. I just want to take a picture. Never mind. I'll get it later. Actually, I could just copy this image. Yeah, if you can't, if you can't, like, save it under the JPEG, just, like, copy the image and open it up and paint and paste it there. It'll show up. You're welcome. Mm. There were, like, it, 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 like, the, when I first read this back, actually, in, um... 2000, I want to say 2015, 2016 is when I learned about this. When I first read one of the articles, what it explained is with this, uh, like, well, technically the goddamn particle is what its name is. Um, the way it was explained is the universe came out like this, but there's a good chance the universe could come back. At some point. Like the universe is ever expanding. But eventually it might just coil back up. Um, but maybe I'm reading the wrong thing. 
and neither has the quantum properties of elemental matter nor those of the carrier of quantum interactions such as electromagnetic field, weak force, or nuclear interactions. Why is it such an important particle? The Higgs field played an absolute decisive role in the first moments after the birth of the universe as it determines the very nature of the vacuum which fills our space-time. It makes the existence of matter and interactions as we know of them possible, and it is responsible for the appearance of the mass of all known elementary particles. Without the Higgs field, and thus without the Higgs boson, there would be no atomic element, no stars, no life in this universe. Why did the research for this particle take so long? Because the Higgs boson is both very heavy and utterly unstable. We'll ignore mass for a minute. With a mass of one... Okay. With a mass of 125, whatever it is, it is 133 times heavier than a hydrogen atom, which means lifetime... It's mean lifetime is between one and two ten thousandths of a billionth of a billionth of a second. Damn, to produce such a heavy particle, given the familiar E equals mc squared, or E equals mass times causality, energy equals mass times causality, to the square equation, you basically have to concentrate a considerable amount of energy in a small volume. This is why we need a high energy collider. The Hadder collider at CERN is the most powerful such machine existing on Earth. The Higgs boson ounce produced will decay in many different ways, and it, only a small fraction of these can be distinguished from the common background. To detect and identify such particles, we have constructed the largest, most complex detectors ever conceived. We then analyze hundreds of billions of proton proton collision events to extract a Higgs boson signal. God damn, that, I, that's a lot of work. I think it's on the un... What is it, the unified field or the ununified? I can't remember what it's called. Why do you still investigate? Two main reasons besides the obvious necessity to perform the most precise characteristics of the new particle. Firstly, we want to understand how the physical vacuum in which we live was created in the early universe. Second, we wanted to understand which this physical vacuum can be made... Which this... Want to understand which this physical what? Secondly, we want to understand which this physical vacuum can be made stable. Don't you mean? Secondly, we want to understand. How? You mean how? Oh, maybe I'm reading this wrong. I don't know. Uh, the Higgs field is very unique as it provides a non-zero mean expected potential energy to the physical vacuum. That is fundamentally what makes the whole difference for our universe. We believe that it is possible to access the shape of the energy potential, which is responsible for the electroweak symmetry breaking. That is, of the very existence of the electromagnetic force of infinite rage and of the weak force acting at very short ranges. It turns out that to do this, we have to study the way the Higgs boston interact with themselves, and for this we need to produce pairs of Higg-Bossons. The Higg-Bossons solved the question of the origin of the mass of all other elementary particles, but its own mass is unexplained. So now we want to know what makes that shit? What does it end? What does it end? I guess it doesn't. This mass is not protected by any symmetry of the theory, and it brings unwanted instability to the theory. So much so that so much so, then a comma, so much so, that, you know, it's whatever. That via quantum processes, the physical vacuum itself could be destabilized by quantum fluctuations. Fortunately, the, fortunately, this is on a time scales considerably larger than the known lifetime of our universe. But we are nevertheless looking for additional Higgs-Boson-like particles that would signal the existence of the new physics needed to stabilize the Higgs-Boson mass. All this motivates the analysis of much more data and, if possible, access to higher collider energies. This is why thousands of scientists from all around the world are still dedicated to this task. That was a lot. Thank you, Space Letter. You're good to me. But yeah, they're like, and this is spaceletter.com. Uh, there it is. The goddamn part, or the god particle explained. 
There's that. But but the way I learned it is like everything came out and then like it gets sucked back in like almost like a little cornucopia. Or that circle thing that helps you learn about composition where it looks like a six and some squares. What? Maybe five distinct particles? National Geographic. Bet! What? That would be interesting. When did this one come out? This came out in 2000... See, now I don't care. Now I don't care. Now, fuck you, National Geographic. Now I don't care. Now I don't care. I'll look at that later, but for right now, I do not care. Thank you, phone. Let's get back to the video. But yeah, that this kind of reminds me of that, because it's just... It, it, and the only reason I, I even thought of that is because, like, well... The god particle, which now I know is the goddamn particle, which is like, I love it. Like, oh, I love it. I love it. I would have made a good scientist if I could focus well enough. I probably would have made a great scientist, but unfortunately, I had science teachers that failed me all the time. Like they be like, I had crazy science teachers, man. Like they be giving me the wrong material all the time and then failing me for doing the wrong work, being like, "You should have known what we were on." This is what the fuck you gave me to do. What do you mean? What, like... I think there was one time. She announced the class that we were all supposed to do something, but she was just like, ah, oh, Sly, you're going to do this chapter. And then the next day, when the turn it in, she's just like, you know what? If you're going to keep playing around in my class, you could just, like, go have detention. I was like... Oh, okay. And then, like, I had to go to the principal's office about it. And I was just like, well, she told me to do this, this, and this. And every time, she'd be like, well, I never told you to do that. And it was just like, okay. I started doing what everybody else started doing. But it was crazy, too, because, like... She would give out quizzes, and I'd know the answers just because I would read the books, but she'd fail me. But then I would show it to other people, and they'd be like, okay, but I got a B on this. I got an A. And this is like, why does she keep failing me? At some point, my fa my parents finally went to have a parent-teacher conference, and at some point, someone just started asking me random questions because we were learning about um, recessive and dominant genes and whatever. And they started asking me basic questions from the class, and I started answering them. And they realized I knew the answers to the questions, so, like, they were confused. It was just like, da-da-da-da. So then my parents started getting, like, copies of, like, my fucking homework and shit from the school. And mind you, this is before computers were used for emails and shit. My parents are old as fuck. They are in their 60s, 70s, so they are not catching up. But they knew how to get a hold of, like, schools and shit to check what the fuck the assignments were and everything, right? So they'd be going over shit with me, and they'd be seeing the assignments. And, then, and like, at some point, my dad was actually helping me with some of them, and he knew the answers, but he was seeing where I was getting failed out and shit. And, like, he was mad. He was just like, I knew the answers! I'm the one who wrote it the fuck down and shit. And then eventually they figured out, oh, she's just failing me on purpose. Like, once they start comparing, like... My test with other students' tests, they started realizing, oh, she's failing me on purpose. She was not a cool... Oh, what was her name? Miss fucking Nutter? That cunt? Ugh. Like, like uh, fat, big titty bitch with buck teeth. Uh, she was mean as fuck, man. No one liked her. She gave me detention all the fucking time. And it's just like, what the fuck is your problem, bitch? Like, constantly mad. Like, did not want anything to do with girls who are prettier than her either. Found out she was a friend of my sister, Nicole, which is probably why she was giving me more shit than what she was any other student, but it was absolutely ridiculous. I actually ended up seeing her again, um, years ago. Was it Dollar General or was... I can't remember what where it was. It wasn't like it was a place that I worked, but it was somewhere where I always shopped. It was either at the Dollar General or the Dollar Tree. But it's kind of like, like one of, well, which one's yellow? I think it was the Dollar General. But like, I saw her as a Dollar General. And then like, she tried talking to me. And I was just like. Yeah. Then I felt better. Because it was just like, I was older. And it's just like, man, I'm way more prettier than you. <laughs> 
That made me feel a little bit more better. Was it vain? Sure. Did I get my point across? You betcha. Did I have to say anything? No. But I, but I remember that. I actually would have been a good scientist if it wasn't for, like... Female science teachers. Honestly, I'll notice that a lot. Like, females will actually go out of the way to sabotage other women. Hence the distinction between females and women. You know, like, like that's, like, there's, there's not very many women there, but there are plenty of goddamn females all over the place. Like, like the goddamn particle, just everywhere. 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 Uh, but they will sabotage, bitch. No problem, I swear. It, it, it happens all the fucking time. It is ridiculous. This is like, I like, you can't compete where you don't compare. So you're just gonna fuck up someone else's day? That's nice. Yeah, that ain't gonna fuck you up later. But, no. Anyway, let's get back to this, because I'm totally distracted. However, it's important to note that the Big Bang Theory only describes the very early stages of our universe. It doesn't tell us why the universe had those characteristics. In physics, if you know the starting conditions of a system and the rules it follows, you can make highly accurate predictions about how it will develop far into the future, limited only by your computational abilities and the inherent uncertainties in the system. But what initial conditions did the Big Bang need to have at its beginning to give us the universe we have? To go boom? It's a bit of a surprise, but what we find is that Thank you, found. there had to be a maximum temperature that significantly about a factor of 1,000 at least, lower than the Planck scale, which is where the laws of physics break down. The universe had to have been born with density fluctuations of approximately the same magnitude of all scales. The expansion rate and the total matter and energy density must have balanced almost perfectly to at least 30 significant digits. It must have been born with the same initial conditions, same temperature, density, and spectrum of fluctuations, at all. I mean, like, if something blows up, I expect it to be at a certain temperature for a good minute. Like, have you ever, like, have you ever seen the sun? Not look directly at it, but have you ever seen it? That thing's on fire all the goddamn time. You know, um, it, it's staying hot for a minute, too. I don't know how long that shit's gonna last, but it keeps doing it. I'm, I'm just saying, like, if, if it's hot already, it's probably gonna stay hot since space is a fucking vacuum. And how the fuck does that work? Fuck are there stars burning all the fucking time if, if there's a whole vacuum in space? Is it the gravity thing? Did, are they just producing oxygen and eating it at the same rate? I just not thought about that. How are stars burning all the fucking time if, they, if they're in a goddamn vacuum? Does, doesn't fire need oxygen? Is it really fire? Is it something else? Is it something worse than fire? Maybe it's holy fire. All locations, even causally disconnected ones, and its entropy must have been much, much lower than it is today, by a factor of trillions upon trillions. When we encounter questions about the initial conditions, oh, which pretty. essentially means why things started the way they did, we have two choices. We can either say that it's that way because it had to be, and we can't know more, or we can attempt to find a process that sets up the necessary conditions. The second approach, known as appealing to dynamics in physics, involves trying to create a mechanism that accomplishes three crucial things. It must replicate all the successful outcomes of the existing oh, model it seeks to improve upon. In this case, the hot Big Bang. Any new idea must be consistent with the established principles. It should explain what the Big Bang theory alone cannot, which includes the initial conditions with which the universe began. Any unresolved issues within the Big Bang must be addressed by the new concept. It must make fresh predictions that differ colors. from those of the original. Like the oranges and the blue, it's always portal colors, I notice. Um, Complementary colors, if you will. There's always opposites, I've noticed, when I'm looking at different uh, nebulas and galaxies and like different uh, sources of light in different photos of galaxies and shit. It's always complementary colors. It's always colors that are opposite to themselves that are the most together. But they don't mix colors, and it's so interesting. Like, look at this right here. Look at this blue, but it's got orange tinging on it. You know, the orange, it, like, it, it, like, it's just more of the more solid mass, but this is more of, like, the vapor of it all. 
I, but I, and this almost looks like a cliff. Like, look at the definition here. It's just gases and shit, but you could swear with all of this composition and all of this depth, it could almost be a platform. That could almost be, like, somebody from Kingdom Hearts coming to get, like, somebody's nobody or someone's heart and turning them into a nobody. This is just some random dude off of Prince of, um... Sam's Atomic. What the fuck was the name of that series? Prince of Persia, Sam's of Time. One of them dudes, right? Which, mind you, if you ever played that game on the PlayStation 2 like I did, the Sands and Time was really annoying. It was a fun game, though. I like the ending, but it was, eh. Original theory, and these predictions should lead to observable, testable, or measurable consequences. So far, the see? only idea that has met these three criteria is the theory of- Hold on. Like, you see the colors? I thought we were already talking about cosmic inflation. Of cosmic inflation. And these predictions should lead to observable, testable, or measurable <laughs> consequences. <coughs> see a lot of yellows and whites? Not exactly black, but a lot of browns. You know what? That thing is not doing well for me. A lot of browns. A little bit of tinges of purple and blue, but definitely a lot of yellows and milky whites here. Complementary opposing colors. So far, the only idea that has met these three criteria. See, there's reds in here, oranges, greens, and blues. All sorts of criteria. For no fucking reason. Is the theory reason. of cosmic inflation, which has achieved remarkable success in all these aspects. In simple terms, inflate. Oh, that was pretty. I wanted to see that. Inflation theory suggests that they have achieved remarkable success in all these aspects. In simple, you got pretty fucking images. I would try to paint that. I would have to do a lot of fucking lifting on that, though. I could do it though, but like, hmm. Yeah, I could totally make up the shapes. Thank you, phone. I thought it was a good idea, too. That's pretty shit. In terms, inflation theory suggests... Look, look at that. That's pretty shit, too. I'm still in this picture, too. I'm sorry, y'all, but, like, this is just... I'm, I'm finding things to paint for sure. This is gorgeous as hell. Like, look at all of this! That looks like a whole banshee thing. Like, look, there's her, like, little, like, uh, wooly thing. There's the wolf's head that, for some reason, his jaws is pointing this way. Here's her whole mouth being like... <sighs> And all that, right? There's that. I'm not sure if this is a, a, a fucking buck or not, but it's something over here. I'm not sure what that would be, though. Then there's this thing where, like, an eye is sitting. There's her hand. Maybe this is her other hand just reaching out to grab something. I don't know. It almost looks like a candle with some tinge lights, and she's trying to touch it. With little eyes popping out. And then, uh, this one right here trying to be like, notice me, Sampa, notice me. That before the universe became hot, dense, and oh, filled with that. matter and radiation everywhere, it was primarily influenced by an immense amount of energy that was a fundamental part of space itself. This energy could be thought of as a field or oh, vacuum energy. Hole. However, unlike today's dark energy, which has a very low energy density, equivalent Is to about snowing? one proton per cubic meter of space, the energy Do you see what I mean? It's fucking, it's goddamn portal colors, the orange and the blue. If you've never played portal, you missed out on a lot of physics. Honestly, you didn't play games in general, like, you missed out on a lot of fucking knowledge, but I can't help you with that. <laughs> but it's like, this right here is like portal, it's like you can go here and end up over here. Or you can go here and end up over here. Oranges and blues, and a little bit of red, which I'm not sure what that would be, but it's connected to this one over here, because that's the same color. That's the only one that's actually... Yeah, everything else is, like, orangey and blue. This and this are the only two that... Well, that one, too, but that's connected to this. But that's the only thing that's actually a different color. That's interesting. The density during inflation was enormous. Roughly... 
10 to the power of 25 times greater than the energy density of dark energy today. The way the universe expands during inflation is quite different from what we're used to. In a typical expanding universe with matter and radiation, as it grows, the number of particles remains the same, causing the density to decrease. This results yeah. in a slowing expansion over time because energy density is linked to the rate of expansion. However, in inflation, where the energy is an inherent property of space itself, the energy density remains constant, and so does the expansion rate. This leads to what we call exponential expansion. Mm -hmm. In this scenario, the universe rapidly doubles in size after a very short time, and then it doubles again, and so on. In a remarkably brief period, a tiny fraction of a second, a region that was initially smaller than the tiniest subatomic particle can expand to become larger than the entire visible universe we see today. Okay. During inflation, the universe undergoes significant stretching, and this has several important consequences, including making the observable universe appear flat, regardless of its initial curvature. Ex I'm just saying, because this just came up in the thought of my head, right? A lot of people talk about, oh, the universe wants this for you, and the universe has... Yeah, the universe doesn't even know what the fuck it's doing. You don't know what the universe is fucking doing. I'm just letting you know, the universe is a lot weirder than what people, like, recognize. And probably don't realize, you know, like, we're more at its whim than, like, anything. You know. What was those lyrics by, uh, Marilyn Manson? Valentine's Day. I saw a pregnant girl today. She didn't know that it was dead inside. Of course it was a lie, but some people are merely born to die. Like, those lyrics, right? It makes me think of that. It's just, thank you, phone. It's just like, you man, like, we could sit here and make the suggestion that the universe wants this or that for us. But, like, we don't even know what the universe's intentions are with this because there, it really doesn't have any intentions. It's just being. It just is. We are a concept of that. And no matter what we do or what we decide or what choices are presented our way, despite the fact that, like, the more choices we have, the harder it is to actually make a decision. Um, doesn't really matter. We're all like Booker DeWitt. No matter how many times we flip the coin, it's always going to end up on, uh, heads. 122 times, you're going to hit heads every time. Every time. Yeesh. Yeesh. Expanding any initial oh conditions from the yes. region where inflation began across the entire visible universe, generating tiny quantum fluctuations and spreading them across the universe, making them nearly consistent on all distance scales, but slightly smaller in magnitude on smaller scales as inflation nears its end. Converting the energy of the inflationary field into matter and radiation, but only up to a map. draw that one. Field into matter and radiation. Shit. Hold on. As inflation nears its end. Converting the energy of the inflationary field into matter and radiation. God damn it. Sorry, y'all. Sorry. I just want it. Energy of the inflationary field into matter and radiation. I give up. Okay. But only up to a maximum oh, temperature memory. that's considerably below the Planck scale, yet comparable to the energy scale of inflation. Creating a spectrum of variations in density and temperature that exist on scales larger than the cosmic horizon. These variations are adiabatic, meaning they have a constant entropy and not isothermal, which means they don't... Okay, is all this actually how the universe and galaxies look, or are these just ink blots in water? Because now I'm starting to look suspiciously at this. It's just like, is this some resin art shit? Highly suspicious. ...don't have a constant temperature throughout. These outcomes replicate the achievements of the non-inflationary hot Big Bang theory, provide a mechanism for explaining the initial conditions of the Big Bang, and make numerous new predictions that differ from a non-inflationary beginning. Okay. Since the 1990s and continuing to the present day, scientific observations have validated the predictions of the inflationary scenario, distinguishing it from the non-inflationary hot Big Bang theory. 
The thing is, there's a minimum amount of inflation that must occur in order to reproduce the universe we see. Okay. And that means there are certain conditions that inflation has to satisfy. Nigga, that looks like that moth thing from Dark Souls 2. Was that Dark Souls 2? No, Dark Souls. I'm thinking of Dark Souls. Not Dark, Dark Souls 2 starts you off at the witch hunt. That's what I'm thinking of. I'm thinking of Dark Souls 1 with that one moth. And you had to summon like that witch with the wooden shield that works against magic. Honestly, in that game, you had to actually like equip yourself right or you're getting fucked up. Honestly, you don't need to bother with the shield till you get to that motherfucker. Because it senses its magical attacks and shit. So, that's what it kind of reminds me of. It's like that lunar moth, motherfucker. By in order to be successful, we can model inflation as a hill, where as long as you stay on top of the hill, you inflate. But as soon as you roll down into the valley below, inflation comes to an end and transfers its energy into matter and radiation. When studying the idea of inflation, physicists have examined various hill shapes, or what they refer to as potentials. Some of these hill shapes work for the concept of inflation, while others do not. The crucial factor for success is that the top of the inflationary hill must have a relatively flat shape. As long as the top of the hill is flat enough, inflation can work as a plausible solution for the initial conditions of our universe. Okay. But now, here's where things get interesting. Inflation, like all known fields, is inherently a quantum field. This means that many of its properties aren't precisely determined. Instead, they follow a probability distribution. Mm -hmm. The more time that passes, the more this distribution spreads out. Yeah. So rather than picturing the process as rolling a point-like ball down a hill, we can think of it as rolling a quantum probability wave function down that hill. Imagine inflation as a process where you're blowing up a balloon. Initially, you have a small deflated balloon, which represents the size of our universe. As inflation proceeds, what? it's like continuously inflating the balloon. Is that the chick from Lazy Town? What the fuck was that girl's name? Is that Lazy Town girl? How are you doing? It's been years. Balloon. If it takes a short time for the balloon size to double, you now have a balloon that's twice as large. Inflate it for the same duration again, and it becomes four times larger. Keep going and it will grow to eight times its original size. After roughly- Hey! I know you're all grown up, but don't do that. I have childhood memories. Like, I know I'm way too old, but I remember watching you. With that Athleticus dude and the other guy who's a villain. Honestly, that show was fucking awesome. Then there was a, what was it, Yo Gabba Gabba or something like? With a black dude in that outfit and all that shit. That one was, that was like H&R Puff and stuff. For the 2000s. Awesome. That was, that was, that was a show. That was a lot of drugs. But that, like, it was entertaining. Honestly, like, I could only watch that when I was high. And even then, that was way too much, honestly. 100 of these inflations, you'd have a balloon that's expanded to a size much, much larger than when you started. Okay, but we said Up to one, this point, lunch. things are a little bit clear. Where now let's consider color? a scenario where the inflationary quantum field rolls down into a valley within a specific region. Yeah. In that location, inflation comes to an end, and the energy of the field transforms into matter and radiation, and this transition leads to what we recognize as a hot Big Bang. This region might have an irregular shape, but it's crucial that enough inflation occurred within it to account for the observational accomplishments we've observed in our universe. The question that arises is, what occurs beyond the boundaries of this region? So what, like, the that thing that looks like an explosion in Orion? Because that'd be a good example, because it looks like shit, like, got fucked up there. It looks like shit got fucked up there. Here's the issue. If you insist on having enough inflation to explain the properties we see in our universe, then beyond the region where inflation ends, inflation will persist. When we consider the relative sizes of these regions, we discover that in order to make the regions where inflation ends consistent with our observations, the regions where it doesn't end become exponentially larger. This discrepancy becomes more pronounced as time progresses. 
Even if there were an infinite number of regions where inflation comes to an end, there would be a larger infinity of regions where it continues. What's more, the various regions where inflation ends, giving rise to hot big bangs, will all be causally disconnected from one another, separated by more regions of inflating space. In simpler terms, if we think of each hot big bang as occurring in a separate bubble universe, these bubbles don't interact or collide with each other. The result is an ever-increasing number of disconnected bubbles as time goes on, all separated by an eternally inflating space. But what if there's a wall? Like an ice wall, like the Flat Earthers say, or some shit. This is what the multiverse is all about, and why some scientists consider it the default position. We have substantial evidence supporting the hot Big Bang theory, and indicating that the Big Bang started with certain initial conditions for which we lack a clear explanation. When we introduce an explanation for these conditions, like cosmic inflation, it leads to unique predictions. Many of these predictions align with what we observe, while others emerge as consequences of inflation. One such prediction is the existence of countless universes and distinct regions, each having its own hot Big Bang event. When you consider all of these regions together, it forms what we call a multiverse. This doesn't mean that different universes have different physical laws or fundamental constants, or that every imaginable quantum outcome occurs in some other part of the multiverse. It doesn't even confirm the actual existence of the multiverse because this is a prediction we can't confirm, validate, or disprove. Okay. However, if the theory of inflation holds and the data strongly supports it, the existence of a multiverse becomes highly likely. You might not like this concept, and you might be unhappy with how some physicists use it, but until a better and viable alternative to inflation emerges, the idea of a multiverse is firmly entrenched. Now at least you understand why it's a prominent and enduring theory. If you have an inflationary universe that's governed by quantum physics, a multiverse is unavoidable. As always, scientists are collecting as much new, compelling evidence as they can on a continuous basis to better understand the entire it cosmos. Exactly. It may turn out that inflation is wrong, that quantum physics is wrong, or that applying these rules the way we do has some fundamental flaw. But so far, everything adds up. Unless they've got something wrong, the multiverse might be inevitable, and the universe we inhabit is just a minuscule part of it. In the world of quantum mechanics, we encounter a certain level of weirdness that's fundamental to the nature of our universe. This weirdness is seen in the behavior of quantum particles, which can exhibit properties that change or become uncertain when measured in different ways. Moreover, when we explore the concept of the multiverse, we find that it is an inevitable consequence of our understanding of inflationary cosmology, which itself is governed by the principles of quantum physics. The idea of a multiverse may seem unconventional and challenging to grasp, but it arises from a consistent framework supported by evidence. Understanding quantum uncertainty in the multiverse can be quite puzzling when compared to our daily experiences, but... You ever heard of those stories where people are like, yeah, there was this one time I was driving in a car and I was at a stop sign and I stopped and then I went to drive forward and all of a sudden, like, bam, this car came out of nowhere and hit me. And I felt the engine going through my body and I felt my bones getting crushed and I heard the bones breaking and I heard gut splatter and I, and I was gargling on my own shit. And the next thing I know, I'm back at the stop sign and I'm stopped and I don't move because I'm surprised that I'm still here. And the next thing I know, I see the car that just hit me. Zoom well past me. Didn't even have their fucking lights on, and that's why I never even saw it to begin with. How am I back here? It's one of those where it's almost like you were given the ability to move forward and then brought back to where you were to see the path and then decide, oh, well, maybe I should wait. Weird little slip. They offer intriguing insights into the complex and profound nature of the universe. That's it for the video. I created playlists where you can watch my videos about reality. Check it out by clicking it on your screen. Thanks for watching. That was fun. Anyway, that's it for this. I gotta find one chick because she actually talks about multiverse theory. And I actually agree with her with what she says about it. But that'll be a video for another day. Until then, I will talk to you guys soon enough. Bye-bye.